Welcome back to Restless. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and we're coming to you straight out of Stamford, Connecticut, along with Diane, Lauren, and a new face. Well, actually, just a new voice. You can't see his face. New face for the rest of you. Yes, it's true. That is true. <laughs> his name is Joe. Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Joe Parada. I am from Bethel, Connecticut. Um, not sure what other information I should know. Uh, you guys should know. I met Father Joseph uh, maybe about 10 years ago or so at this point. You were my eighth grade CCD teacher, and, yes. here, and here we are. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> At least it worked for one kid. <laughs> he learned about Jesus. And what do you do for a living? Oh, I am a uh, paralegal, for, at least for now. At least for now. <laughs> for now, not forever. Please God. But for now, I'm paralegal. Yep. Nice. Seeing where God leads. That's awesome. Beautiful. So today's topic is actually uh, one that's definitely on my heart and in the world. It's uh, blessed are the persecuted because persecuted Christians are actually still very much uh, prevalent. You know, we often think of persecutions being as something you get thrown to the lions in the Colosseum, but of course it's uh, it's still going on in a number of countries. I've heard of something like 51 countries or something like that, um, where first Christian persecution, maybe not to the point of shedding your blood, but certainly to losing your job or your home, or your freedom or uh, something else that's very valuable. So are you aware that this even goes on? Because here in America, we're so blessed, you know? Honestly, no. And so I had to do a lot of research for this uh, this podcast topic. So, yeah, it's not really something that I thought about. And after kind of reading some articles, I was very surprised at how prevalent it is, how many countries it's present, and the extent of sort of the uh, the persecution and the violence. Yeah. So was I right? Fifty one, or is that that may be an old statistic? I think it's I think it's more. There's like a top sort of fifty. So wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. I've always known that it's gone on like my whole life. You know, I feel like uh, my aunts would say, you know, Christians are persecuted in other parts of the world, and it was hard to understand, right? Because we have this freedom here, and we've always gone to mass, and no one's ever bothered us. But I don't know any of you know the stats that um, you guys looked into. So I'm curious to find out more. Yeah, when I when I saw this question, um, my mind went first to the church in China, which is a sort of complicated situation for a number of reasons. But um, I think actually maybe about a week ago, Bishop Peter Zhao Zumin uh, was kidnapped by the Chinese government. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> nice, nice Chinese. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was kidnapped by the Chinese government. I don't think he's been released yet, but I was reading into his story a bit, and he's been abducted a few times, subjected to um, re-education and other, other unpleasantries. And um, yeah, re-education, yeah, yeah. So and so, and, and not just in China proper, but but in um, but in Hong Kong as well. Um, so yeah, I, the, the the Chinese Church uh, was where, I, where I, my mind first went, although also in Africa, um, parts of Europe as, as too. Yeah, there's a. Uh... There was a woman at one of my former parishes, Holy Spirit in Stanford, who had, when the year 2000 was approaching, she had heard that there were more martyrs in the 20th century than any all the other centuries combined. And she actually uh, decided to kind of start a collection of relics of the martyrs. So she wrote to all these different uh, religious congregations and said, you know, tell us about the martyrs from your congregation, the Franciscans and Dominicans. And they sent her all kinds of stuff, including they sent her one of only two relics of Maximilian Kolbe in the entire world piece of his beard clipping because of course he was in Auschwitz and when he died they just threw him into a crematorium and uh, so there's no other really relics of his body which is kind of kind of amazing that really brought to my mind like just the the real prevalence of it today because some of these people that I was looking at and the pictures and the relics were like they're from 1992 you know like times when I was alive I was like oh my gosh like these saints it's really remarkable yeah and I can give some statistics go for it yeah yeah so Christianity, uh, according to Christianity Today, every day, 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Um, 13? Yeah, yep. Wow. And the top worst persecutors have remained relatively unchanged. So after North Korea is Afghanistan, followed by Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Yemen, Iran, Nigeria, India. Um, and Open Doors categorizes the primary sources of Christian persecution into eight groups. So there's Islamic oppression. I think there's like 29 countries there. Um, clan oppression, um, dictatorial paranoia, religious nationalism, communist and post-communist oppression, mm. uh, Christian denominational protectionism, organized crime and corruption, and secular intolerance. Um, wow. Wow. So, wow. yeah, and it's, I guess, Christian persecution is most sharply on the rise in South and East Asia. Um, 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, we kind of talked about China, but China has also exported, you know, surveillance technology and systems training hmm. to more than 100 countries, according to, I think this is Church in Need. Um, and yeah, the Church in Need reports that at least 84 countries have laws against blasphemy of Islam that often target Christians and other re- religious minorities. Um, in India, Hindu nationalists want to make the country a Hindu state. So Christians and Muslims have few, if any, rights. And um yeah, I mean, I, we we could just <laughs> the the facts just it, it, they keep going, but it, it's amazing. And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't plan this question beforehand, but it, it strikes me when you mention that, like, what would motivate somebody to have such a hostility to Christianity, which is such a, a peaceful religion when it's done right? I mean, certainly we've had you know our share of uh, people who have killed in the name of Christ, but I mean, in today's world, like especially in America, we have such religious freedom. Why would some government find Christianity as a threat? Well, I think there's probably a couple of different reasons that I can think of right now. One being that, you know, Christianity is very much, I mean, we recognize the dignity of the human person. And so if you recognize the dignity of the human person, there are fundamental rights that sort of proceed from that understanding. Mm. And, you know, these governments like China and everything, they view that sort of as a threat. And also just, I mean, Christ being like, they they might see that too as, as a threat to like their power and sort of the fact that Christianity is communal of like, you know, families and whatever they try to break down the family and, Mm. uh, sort of the communal aspect that Christianity, um, you know, encourages. Yeah. I mean, if a Christianity properly practice is as absurd, is as subversive today as Christ was in his time, right? So the, Mm. the political and religious authorities in his day persecuted him. And so I think it's, it's sort of fitting that those of our day persecute Christians, right? I mean, um, a religion that, that preaches uh, you know, tolerance of others and um, you know self-sacrificing love um, is not going to be is not going to be able to jive well with dictatorial uh, nations or cultures that that oppose those things, right? So mm. it's also clearly about control, right? Controlling the people, and um, in a lot of cases, it's like getting them to just work for you, right? Like Diane is saying, people don't have rights. So if you have Christianity and you know you're a person of worth and you have dignity. You may want to stand up for yourself or you may have this higher calling or this hope, right, that may draw you out of it or lead others to um, come together to, you know, speak out or revolt or whatever. And of course, these governments don't want that happening. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the paradox, though. You know, Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, wrote that the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians, you know, you look at the early church martyrs in the you know the first few centuries. Instead of putting down Christianity, that's why she led people to be drawn and attracted to it. Was the courage of these people who were willing to shed everything for Christ? You know, I mean, is that a, I mean, do you think that even today that's still valid? You know, that, that that new holiness is being sprung up because of these martyrs. Well, the other piece to that was also that the people who were being martyred went to their death with joy correct? Mm, Right. And so other people witnessed that and had to be so confused, right? Like, how can you be at peace right now when you're facing your brutal death? Um, And so that spread. um, And and I think people just wanted to figure out what was that joy. So I don't know how martyrdom happens today. You know, it'd be interesting to know, are people still experiencing that joy of the early Christians? And are other people aware of that? Can other people witness that? you know, to where it doesn't matter that people are being killed in, you know, the community that it's happening. Other people are still recognizing there's something about this, right? There must be some truth here, some beauty or some goodness that I don't know, but I want. So it's still able to spread. It strikes me that, I mean, in the age of social media, where every crossword one person says to another in Target goes viral, you'd think that we would see, we'd be flooded every day by by videos of martyrdom. Mm. But it's occurring to me now that I've never seen one. I have seen one. Yeah. And back in 2011, I think it was, ISIS recorded a video Mm -hmm. of executing 20 men on an Egyptian beach. And what was powerful, which kind of goes to your point, was that um, after they killed these 20 men, one of the men who killed them was so moved by their example that they said, their God is my God too. And they were killed as well. So they ended up being 21 martyrs. But I think, yeah, and going back to Lauren's point, and we were we mentioned him earlier, Max St. Maximilian Kolbe. Um, I mean, I think I'm pretty sure, you know, he uh, he ended up taking uh, somebody's place, um, volunteered to to essentially die and be starved to death. And 
I know when he was like locked in wherever he was with those guys who were also chosen or, you know, had to had to die. He was leading them in hymns and he was <laughs> singing and I'm pretty sure he was like everyone else died. And he was like whenever those guards came in and he was just kneeling on the floor and he had a smile on his face. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure they had to inject yeah. him. Right. Yeah. Lethal injection. Yeah. yeah. But he was I mean, that has to be when I hear this story. I mean, it's like you. He's living for something beyond. He's willing to sacrifice his life. So mm. I think that that is a super powerful um, witness. And just, I mean, nobody's going to die for you know something that's not true that they don't believe is true. And that's for a lie. For a lie, yes. Yeah. So it's super compelling. And I think, I mean, it inspires me. I'm sure it inspires a lot of other people to holiness. Yeah. Like wow. I remember back in 2004, my home church burned down to the ground. It was. It, pretty sad experience, but I was very inspired that my pastor ran in to the burning building to rescue the Eucharist. And you're like, that man believes that that's really the body and blood of Jesus, you know, because if you're really li- literally willing to risk your life for it. And yeah, it's, it, it makes faith the most, probably most incarnate it can ever be is when you give your life for it. That's intense. And of course, as I mentioned, the 20th century has actually had more martyrs than all the other centuries combined, which is kind of mind-boggling but you think of course about you know what stalin did and a lot of those were religious prisoners you know orthodox priests and whatnot and um you know people forget that the holocaust had 11 million victims but only six million of them were jews five million of them were others you know disabled um and many were catholic priests and nuns and we had some martyrs out of that do you have any famous uh, like uh favorite 20th century martyrs other than colby which we already we're going to say well, Maximilian Colby. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, that that's the one that I had thought about, but I, I would also say Maria Goretti, not, not having to do with the Holocaust, obviously. Oh, that's true. But yeah, yeah sort of a martyr of charity because, I mean, just it, just going on the theme of these people with convictions that are stronger than, you know, willing to be stabbed to death, you know, and to, um, you know, to because of what she believed in. So, yeah. Yeah, I thought of um, San Jose Sanchez del Rio. I was just going to uh, mention yeah. him, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, his story is pretty uh, startling, especially because he was so young. I mean, what was he, 14 or something like that? Yeah, do you guys know his Who story? Who is he? No. no. So he was um, he was a young boy in Mexico. He was martyred in 1928. He joined the Cristero movement, which was a sort of revolutionary movement in Mexico that opposed Mexican governments. Um, I guess they outlawed Catholicism and persecuted it. They did, yeah. And I, I, I mean, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Father, but I think he he ran away and tried to join the army, the Cristero army, and they said, no, you're, you're too young. They made him like a, fl- like a flag bearer or something. He mm-hmm. was captured and told to renounce the faith, and he refused. And ultimately, he was, they, I think they skinned the bottom of his feet, yeah. marched him to the center of the town, and shot him on in the cemetery all around all the way saying you know renounce the faith renounce the faith and him saying no and I, as I remember he, the story ends with him making a, a cross of his blood and maybe kissing it before he died something to that effect yeah. um, I, I remember I mentioned this to the kids who I teach these to to because I mean this guy's was kid was their age right I mean it's sort of startling um, and really moving strength right and commitment to the faith and belief yeah. in Jesus Christ and there's a great movie about that called For Greater Glory which if you've never seen is makes my top three movies of all time oh. list one of the only movies I cried during in theaters. Yeah. Oh, have to check it out. Definitely got to check it out. Yeah. Lauren, you know what well, I mean? when you, when you mentioned this, I, I wasn't even thinking of saints. I was thinking, are there people, you know, just who we know are dying, but uh, you know, do you I, know any? I, I don't know any. I mean, <laughs> cause please go rescue them. If, uh, like, well, I don't know if we are. could do anything. Right. It's in these other countries. Yeah. I don't know. What can we do though? Just pray for them. I mean, how do we stop Christian persecution throughout the world? We're not let them, not let them go forgotten too, right? Yes. I mean, I mean the fact that it's not well known that Christianity is widely persecuted in the, in, in the world is itself sort of indictment of the faithful who aren't persecuted, right? Who aren't um, talking about it and thinking about it as often as we should. I think. Yeah, we get very comfortable in America because we can go to church anytime we want. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so we should have our conscience pricked by these these young men and women who are laying down everything for Christ. One of my favorites, you guys know the story of St. Anna Wang? No. She was great. Uh, she was a, in the Boxer Rebellion in the ni- turn out around the turn of the 1900s in China. And according to the story, she was um, she was this young 14-year-old girl who uh, the, the, the communists came in and, and basically broke down the doors of the church and took the Eucharist out and just threw it on the floor and then arrested the, the priest and put the priest in the rectory next door with a guard outside and everything. And smashed all the stained glass windows so they can, you know, he could look down and see the Eucharist there on the floor. And just, you know, he's weeping and weeping. And then he notices that this young girl had snuck in 
a back entrance and was praying in front of the, one of the Eucharistic hosts that had tra- been trampled on. And at the end of her time of prayer, she picked it up and reverently received it. And then she left the church and she came back the next night and did the same thing and the next night and the next night until all of the Eucharistic hosts were consumed. And the very last time she got up and I guess she knocked over a candle stand or something and the guards heard her and they, they broke into the church and found her and dragged her out and beat her to death with the rifles on the, the front steps of the church. But to me, that's a great inspiration. You know, this 14-year-old girl recognizing the power of the Eucharist, the real presence of Christ, that he's willing, he's worth dying for. I don't know. I've always thought that was a... It's amazing, really. Story. I mean, I don't know that... Who has that kind of courage, you know? And we're talking about such young people, like Maria Goretti as yeah. well. Yeah, and I mean, the unbelievable thing, Maria Goretti, I mean, I think she was 12, right? So, but also, like, the fact that she had such a strong conviction at a young age, I mean, that's inspiring in and of itself, but then also to, like, uh, we just went to a, a talk at St. John's, um, and the priest went graphically through sort of what she went through on um, when she was admitted to the hospital. I mean, she had to have surgery without anesthesia, super painful. She completely, I mean, I think the priest came and kind of explained the situation. She was very um, dehydrated, but they actually couldn't give her water. Um, and, you know, the priest was like, we can't, we can't do this. And she was like, that's fine. I'm going to offer it up for for souls. Um, and, you know, she forgave her perpetrator, Alessandro, and said that she wanted to see him in heaven with her. And I mean, just it, the story is really cool, too, because of the implications of that one act of forgiveness. Um, you know, Alessandro ended up, you know, completely converting. Um, I don't think he didn't become a priest, but he was. No, he's a brother, I think. Or... Yeah. Yeah. And just, um, just the impact of sort of like Maria's act selfless act of forgiveness in such a difficult situation i mean it shows that it's possible and also that people can have a complete conversion and be brought to christ through sort of um one person's witness and courage and uh it's it's sort of incredible to see how god works through um through the youth (laughs) for for those who don't know the beginning of that story saint margaretti was attempted to be raped by a a young man named alessandro and he he furiously stabbed her when she refused his advances. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, she's an amazing martyr, martyr for purity. So, you know, closer to home, bringing it back home, because you're right, there's not a whole lot we can do for our brothers and sisters who are persecuted overseas, except for pray for them and, and remember them and, and keep, keep, their, keep our attention in the world as like recognizing that they're, you know, far, you know, that they're real. But have you ever experienced any much more minor persecution for your faith, whether it's college or the workforce or by your friends or anything like that? I would say, I mean, at work, it's um, maybe not as, I don't know what the right word is, like a parent, right? So it's not outright persecution, but it is in the sense of there's an ideology that is kind of shoved down your throat and you're almost made to comply with it because if you were to speak out or say anything to oppose that particular perspective, which is relativism, um, you know, you're you're condemned as not inclusive, um, you know, a bigot, all, all these things. Um, and so it's difficult to, I think, work in the secular world today because, you know, a lot of people think of relativism as just everyone's entitled to do whatever they want, think whatever they want, um, have their own opinion. But it is an ideology that is espoused by these corporations and um, people. And so, uh, you know, it, it is a form of persecution because we're, we're being forced to kind of, um, I guess, adapt our lives to this ideology and they don't even see it as like an ideology. It's more of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I would say that it is, it's difficult to live the faith and like really be outspoken at work about certain things and um, things that are celebrated and, um, you know, committees and uh, stuff that comes out around a lot of these social issues now. I, know, I remember you telling me some good stories from your college days Oh, huh. about persecution. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know about, I don't know that I recall anything I've ever experienced persecution, right? But I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, um, you're weird, right, when you're at school and, um, you know, you're going to go to mass as opposed to go to, to a party or just whatever else is going on. Um, and I think that college especially is um, a time of rebellion for most people. Um, and sort of if you're not 
if you're not sort of cutting loose and sort of breaking free of all of the sort of constraints your parents put on you, and if and you know, and you're instead dedicating yourself to you know going to mass, going to confession, and trying to live a holy life, yeah, I mean that that makes you stand out, right? And ultimately, you'll get pushed back because you know um, you're different from everybody else, right? And I think some ways, some one way that it can sort of manifest is in sort of strained friendships. Right, so because you're not going going to that activity that everybody else is going to because mass is at six thirty and that's what you're going to be doing instead, you end up sort of out of the social circle. Um, but again, we we're just we we're just talking about people being stabbed to death, so I'm not going to say that's persecution and stuff. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, or even just like like I remember um, a number of years ago, however uh, Christmas Day fell. If you were going to go to Christmas Eve Mass, you had to go to Sunday Mass and then Christmas Eve Mass in the same day. I remember even my family was like, why, that's this, why would you go to Mass twice one day? That's, that's ridiculous. And I was like, that's not ridiculous. That's what the church says. The church has mentioned your authority. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. You know, um, And that sort of in little ways like that, one, right, one is sort of asked to, 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 to say no to what the church asks us to do and sort of say yes to what the world asks us to do. Hmm. I know I, I kind of agree. It, it is kind of almost petty to say like, oh, that's persecution when we talk about real persecution. But I think that our faithfulness in these small things could lead to faithfulness if we were ever asked to give more of ourselves. So it's good training ground in a sense, you know. Ultimately, if you're willing to skip mass because your friends want to hang out with you, then if someone says, you know, renounce the faith or I'll shoot you, you're not going to say, you know, thanks be to God, go ahead and shoot me, right? I mean, if you're right, you're right. It, um, weakness in the small things would definitely lead to weakness in the big things, right? So I suppose, you, you know, in that sense, yeah, right? The small things are important. Have you experienced persecution? Um, yeah, I mean, even from my own family, like my brother, um, has told me that he thinks that I'm wasting my life in becoming a priest. So that's definitely a strained relationship. And, you know, I can't say that our relationship was ever particularly that strong to begin with, but especially as I got deeper into my faith and he got further away from his faith, that was a, a tension in the relationship. Yeah, I don't think I've really experienced persecution to my face. I do wonder what people may say about me behind my back or what people may think about me or even I have tons of cousins, you know. I I don't know what people think even just being on this podcast or if they've listened or or what. So I wonder, but Well, what about your brother? My brothers are both Catholic and practicing. Oh, they're both practicing? Yeah. Oh, I wasn't sure if the older one was. Yeah. Oh, good. So, yeah, the family unit is strong, but um I don't know. And then friendships. And then I try to open up more about my faith now. Like I do retweet or whatever. We're on Instagram and I really only do Instagram. I don't really do much on Facebook anymore, but I try to share, you know, posts here and there. And then I'll look and see who has seen it, you know, but it's not like anyone has like insulted me, you know, or come back at me with anything mean. But I also kind of wonder like that could be coming, you know? And so it's like what Joe's saying, like, will I be ready for it? You know, how am I going to take it? And that kind of gives us, brings us to the next question. Would you be able to give up your life for Christ like these martyrs have? Do you think you could do it? It's such a, like, it's like, Very I think it really shows, though, where your faith is at. Because I think that the normal human response is always to preserve your life, right? Like at all costs. And you're like, well, God knows that I have faith for him, right? So I could try to preserve my life, but he knows I still believe in him. But then you failed, right? Because you didn't stand up for your faith. So it's hard. I think it would depend on the circumstance, you know, what, what is happening yeah. around me. I, I think that I would be willing to die quickly for my faith, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not going to pretend that I know for a fact that if someone said I'm going to torture you for a year, if you don't renounce your faith, I, I'm not going to pretend that I know for a fact I would say, oh yeah, absolutely, I, I could do that. I would like to think I, I, I could, but you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead and say that that's a 100% thing, unfortunately. But you know, I mean, yeah. I would like to think that I would. And I, you know, um, and I think like we said before, just the sort of the willingness to sort of sacrifice yourself, yourself in small ways and die to yourself in small ways, I think will ultimately make you able to do these things. Ultimately, I don't think God puts us in situations we can't handle. So um, I think I would take confidence in that. Yeah, I think his grace would meet you there if you were asked to give that ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, and I mean, if you're not ready, I would say it's a challenge, you know, to um, to kind of figure out, um, I I mean, if if we really believe what Christ and the church proclaim, then we should be willing to, you know, endure whatever. Um, it's interesting though, Maximilian Kolbe, I was just thinking back to him. I think the, there's an interesting story about the guy that he took the place of to die because I think he really suffered after that. He ended up surviving. Um, 
and being released. And he felt guilty because he basically had said, like, I have a wife and a family. And uh, he felt like he almost caused Maximilian Kolbe's death. But um, I think I heard this maybe on a podcast um, that basically someone had explained to him or he had come to the conclusion that Maximilian Kolbe couldn't have done otherwise because that was that was the man that he was. And Mm. so um, I just I thought that was so profound when I heard that of like, yeah, he it wasn't even a really a cho- like he didn't decide. It was like he had that that was who he was and so there was no other option. Right. It wasn't a one-off thing. Yeah, no, know. it wasn't. It was so th- it's I don't know. It just it, I think that kind of like draws at least me deeper in my faith in terms of like do I really love God for God? Do I love God for what he gives me? You know, like these people mm. like Maximilian Kolbe, I mean Love God for God. Whatever whatever God asked of him, he was willing to do. If it meant losing his life, sacrificing his will, whatever, it didn't matter. Have you guys ever heard the name Cassie Bernal? No. When I was in high school, that was kind of all the rage for youth ministers to talk about. And so when I was a sophomore in high school is when the Columbine shooting happened. And uh, Cassie Bernal was apparently a girl who was in Columbine at the time. And she was asked by one of the gunmen, do you love Jesus? And she said, yes. And they shot her in the face and it's, you know, how she died. And so a lot of people were really kind of holding her up as, as a, a martyr. And, and I was, you know, kind of, I was impacted by her story, certainly to hear that here's this teenager who had, you know, had to make that public declaration. And that was the last thing she ever said, you know, that she loved Christ. And, and uh, then they, you know, actually they end up publish, publishing several books about her, about the fact that, you know, she really did like live out her faith. She went through a really like, deep conversion when she was like 14 or 15. I think she had really gotten in trouble like earlier on in her life. And then she really kind of straightened out and she found Christ and, and Christ became the center of her life. And she got involved in her church and her youth group. And, and so this was like the culmination of, of a life of saying yes to Jesus was well, making that ultimate sacrifice. And, I don't know. I just thought that was a very, for me, a pertinent example because like she was my age at the time. I was my age, and I was like, "Whoa, that's pretty profound." Yeah, I was nowhere near that as a teenager. No, <laughs> it's, and, no. I mean, the faith was just a, a Sunday thing. Yeah, not it's, even so. It's it's really it's cool to see how God works very differently in different people, but we're all on sort of different journeys. Definitely. No, he brings you along, clearly, right? Her conversion was preparation for that moment. Yeah. And she, like, succeeded in the moment, you could say, right? Because she likely went straight to heaven. Hopefully. Which is what we all want, right? That's the hope, yeah. I mentioned earlier the quote about um, uh, martyrs being the being the, the blood of martyrs being the seed of saints, something like that. And, like, that's a perfect example, right? Because her witness at least moved you, probably moved others. Oh, yeah. Think all the souls that you're saving as a priest by, you know, by extension. I mean, it's sort of a, 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 a moving way to look at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, just getting the stories out encourages all of our faith to realize that here are people that made the ultimate sacrifice. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Restless. You can find us on Veritas Catholic Network, 1350 AM. And my challenge for you this week is to go out and get martyred. I mean, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to make others aware and to make yourself aware of the real reality of Christian martyrdom throughout the, the world today. Pray for those martyrs. Uh, be inspired by their example. Imitate their example in the small ways in everyday life so that if we are asked to give the ultimate sacrifice, we with, with a generous heart will say yes. Tune in next time for more Restless. God bless.